Morning everyone, welcome to Everything Boating's YouTube channel. Uh, yesterday we had the boat out of the water, today we're having it surveyed by a marine surveyor called Nick Bass. Roll tape. Hi, I'm here to survey a Westerly Conway. I've just established by looking at the hull number that was built in 1980. And I'm going to start at the stern of the boat and work my way forward in no right. particular order. Take it away, Nick. <laughs> I'm working my way down the boat, just tapping and finding the bulkheads, looking for delamination. That's a bulkhead. Looking for cracks to see if there's anything above the waterline or below the waterline on that bulkhead where the laminate might have stretched. But I haven't found anything so far, which is good. Right, I'm going to see what the propeller's like. A little bit dull. And the edges of the propeller are actually coming away and just the light tapping that I'm doing with this knife, I'm actually putting dents in it. So the, the propeller is desinkified, or the, the zinc is coming out of the um, of the metal. It's bronze, but bronze um, will contain some zinc. So it's not. It, it's it's there's hundreds of different types of bronze which contain nickel, zinc, and tin, and copper. Um, I'm going to scrape back a little bit and I can see that the propeller is quite pink. So that means that the zinc is coming out of the metal due to desinkification. And so the, the propeller itself is becoming an anode. So it used to have, I think, an anode on the shaft here and that is depleted and fallen off and so it needs a new anode. The shaft is actually worn as well, you can actually feel it's quite pitted and it, that's not really going to affect it too much because the, uh, the important part is up here inside the cutlass bearing housing so that part there doesn't matter too much but before too long it's going to need a new propeller I'm now going to scrape on the cutlass bearing housing and it should come up as quite a nice yellowy metal underneath but it's dull and pink-ish. It's not too bad, it's salvageable, you could use it but you can see that the metal, that's what it should be like there, that's, that's a, a much brighter yellowy colour so that's okay. But as you can see, that's duller, so that means that it's desinkificated. The zinc is actually coming out of the metal. It'll be okay, but I need to check with my meter to see if the anode is connected up to uh, the cut sparing housing. And to do that, I'm just going to clean the anode just to get a good contact between the anode and my multimeter to make sure that it's actually going to um, get a good reading of continuity between that and that shiny bit there and also on the propeller which I cleaned. So I'll just go and get my meter. What you say to check put the meter on ohms just check for continuity that the battery's okay, so I've got perfect continuity there between the, the electrodes. Then put it onto the anode, onto a clean bit of the anode, and then put it onto the cutlass bearing housing, and actually no contact whatsoever. There's no continuity there at all. There's no connection. So that means that the um, 
the catalyst bearing housing is not connected to this anode so this anode is not doing anything that um, could mean that the, the wires on the back of the anode are not doing anything that they might be missing or disconnected or it's made out of plastic which it won't be <laughs> so I'm going to check on the propeller now and again there's no contact there whatsoever so I've got a shiny clean bit of anode here and it's doing absolutely nothing and it's not doing anything on the propeller shaft or anything I just check it's working fine because look I've got I've got perfect continuity there so it's not that the propeller is dirty or anything I've actually got a good contact but there's no contact between the anode and the propeller so that's why it's desinkified why the, the zinc has come out of the propeller it's because it's not being um, protected by the zinc anode Post is connected so I'm just going to see if the rudder post and the answer is no the rudder post is not connected to the anode no nope, there's no continuity there at all so those wires need to be redone Old antifouling is really unpleasant stuff and really gritty and it's got a lot of biocide in it. I'm always worried about red antifouling because it could be Jotun which is very high strength antifouling which has got a lot of biocide in it. It's also um, it, it's quite a, a bitumen based product so it's, it can actually be carcinogenic as well. Um, so you don't want to breathe it in and you don't want to get it in your eyes. So I'm going to do it, uh, I'm using a scraper where the antifouling actually comes out the hole at the bottom and if you're going to scrape the hole of the boat off you put a vacuum cleaner on there. Um, so I'm going to scrape away the antifouling in about 20 places per side and then I'll be able to work out, put my moisture meter on it to see how much moisture is in the hole. very very thick and hard the antifouling uh, because it's baked on. I've got epoxy underneath so it's had an epoxy treatment in the past. Now that could be for anti-osmosis or osmosis protection but it's, uh, I'm not going to disturb the epoxy I'm just going to put my meter on that area now to check for moisture content. Now I'm going to do lots of places all along the side of the boat later on. I'm just uh, calibrating the meter because uh, each day is different and the atmospheric conditions are different each day. This is a very old meter but it's very very reliable and they do work well. What I do is put it above the water line to take a reading first to get a datum because what you do is you compare. So I'm finding that this reading above the waterline is four. Now, if it's four below the waterline, the hull will be bone dry, but I doubt if it's gonna be like that. It's 16. So the reading below the waterline is about normal for a westerly of its age, and it's epoxied. So the epoxy is gonna give a slightly higher reading anyway. So it's not alarming. But it's not bone dry, but it isn't. It's it's normal for a westerly of its age. Right, I'm looking at the hull number here. So it's SOU for South, which means Southampton. It's the Lloyd's number, and then it's one three one one. So it could be uh, boat number one three one one, and the last two digits are eighty. So that means that it's a 1980 build. Then down here we have a, um, a moulding number, which I recorded as well. So the 
is to take a hammer and check for any problems. So plastic faced hammer so it doesn't damage anything. And I'm going to tap those areas where I found those skin fittings, those old skin fittings, which might have been um, covered over. I'm just going to tap them to see if they're loose. and tap test looking for areas of delamination. The westerlies are a solid laminate so there shouldn't be any but if I find any dull, dull spots it could be that the lamination or the laminate is coming apart. Right, I'm walking up and down the jet deck to check for delamination because uh, quite often the, the balsa core of a, a westerly absorbs water so the deck becomes quite spongy. So you can usually feel that by walking on it. It's quite spongy and bad here. And that's because water has got into the holes where the anchor windlass used to be. So there's uh, a deck leak which is missing from here. And the stanchion bases are usually uh, and open basis you usually lose on a westerly so water gets in and around where bolts are for the anchor windlass the, the water has got in to the bolts core underneath so it becomes a little bit spongy to walk on. There's very little you can do about it because um, there's very little you can do about it because uh, the the cure for it will be worse than the symptoms. So on an older boat, this is not worth a great deal of money. Sometimes best just to leave it as it is and try to stop any more leaks getting in. What you don't want to happen is for fresh rainwater to get in and then for it to freeze in a very cold winter and then it will start to pull apart it, it, when the ice expands and contracts, then it will uh, all become mush. So you don't want that happening, but sometimes to dismantle the interior of a, a yacht to remove the balsa core or, or the stiffening rubber is, is far more trouble than it's worth. So Westerly, the, the outer skin is actually quite thick, so it's best to, to leave it as it is in the end of the day. Unless you haven't bought the boat, then if you haven't bought the boat, think about walking away from it or um, this negotiating uh, uh, tool to uh, make sure that you uh, get priced out because it will be very, very expensive to fix if you need to. This deck used to have Treadmaster on it. If I walk over to that side, where this is Treadmaster um, non slip matting which is glued down and it does help spread the load of the weight of, of, of your feet on the deck and it does stiffen the deck to some extent with the glue um, but it peels off and after a while it looks quite ugly. The superstructure in this case has been painted probably because it was kept in a very hot climate or a very sunny climate so the, the two layers of the gel coat might have post cured so they would have continued to cure after the boat was built and so the top layer of the gel coat would have started to graze so once it starts grazing all you can do is uh, bleach out the dirt with oxalic acid um, to try and clean it or paint it you can't, it's very difficult to re-gel um, a, a, a superstructure like this. These have got uh, small windshields um, and they will crack on a, a regular basis. They usually crack from the screw holes or from that bolt hole there. I'm going to 
walk on the coach roof as well, checking for delamination, which is quite common. And the other thing that I've done is to look at the master because I've found that there are bulges around the master. I'm going to move this uh, boom out of the way in a minute to have a look at it, but you can see here there are bulges here and here, and there's cracking here, and this is quite dipped in. So it means that the, the whole mass step is actually sunk, um, and that's due to mass compression where the plinth underneath that supports the mast is not strong enough for it to absorb water and it's compressed. So that's quite a common problem on old westerlies. Also we've got some cracking here. Which is related to the mast uh, compression. Right, Jared, if I baby stay chain plate here which has been removed to be refitted with re rigging the boat and it's got quite a lot of rust staining on it so the, the standing rigging has, has uh, corroded um, this will need to be refitted and this is quite a common problem of water getting in through the baby stay chain plate because there's a lot of pressure on it well, I'll just move the... I can see there's, there's a lot of bulging on the coach roof here on the starboard side and it's possible that water has got in through these deck glands here for the wiring and so the coach roof is uh, probably wet inside that's not helped by making the plywood plinth underneath the master is is become wet as well um, I'm sure that these bolt holes are leaking underneath here and that's why somebody's covered them in tape because the, the holes that bolt the mast step down are uh, leaking. In fact, they're actually missing. So, somebody knows about the mass compression problem and has been uh, trying to treat it. So, that will need to be removed and refitted, and the mass compression post inside. Uh, repaired, maybe the plinth replaced inside. Right, um, where do you start with all this? This is uh, ugly beyond belief. <laughs> so, someone has uh, replaced the steering wheel, it's a bit too small, it's much newer. The autopilot controller is quite small. Uh, and ugly and looks a bit Heath Robinson uh, and where do you start with this monstrous carbuncle of this gantry here for the uh, it's it's over engineered but it's flimsy uh, the wind generator pole can't extend it down onto the, onto the deck so it's really not doing very much and it's made out of low grade stainless steel because it's all going rusty and the welding on it is uh, is appalling. So I think I would remove all this and um, put it back in original and have a new pushback made up. Um, if you're in the British rain and you're here, that's going to drip on your head. <laughs> so that's just going to collect rain. It's not going to stop the sunshine getting at you because usually the sunlight comes from that way, not directly above because we're not on the equator. Um, somebody's replaced the compass. The engine control lever has been replaced, that's a lot of blue mile one. Um, the build pump is in quite poor condition, so it needs to be replaced. And the next thing I want to show you is on the western you've got what's called the yard number. So the yard number plate is just here. So that's the identifies the boat with that number. Right, I'm looking at seacocks, never easy to get at. These are Blake's type seacocks and they do turn quite easily which is good so that means that they've been serviced 
and they're not badly corroded and we've got a an ordinary gate valve seacock as well which is turning okay and then it's got a, a wider foot diverter because there's a, a holding tank so it's, it's also a bigger light diverter here which is quite new so a lavac toilet which is uh, made by Simpson Lawrence which uh, of course they, they made Blake's and they work by having a a seal which is now sealed so I can't lift the lid so it works by vacuum so that seems to work quite well um, this is a, a vent pipe which is extremely ugly um, and it's possibly from a holding tank or I hope it's not a holding tank but it could be a a vent from a water heater so I'm going to have to find out what this is but there's, there's no place on a boat for that uh, ugly looking thing so we're going to have to find out where that went to um, not a great deal of room in this cupboard for your toothbrush <laughs> <laughs> so if you're going to put your toothbrush somewhere oh, uh, I don't think that's going to whoops okay so no room for your shampoo that's the holding tank this um connection here for the holding tank is very Heath Robinson the way that it's um, uh, if that's the pump out for the holding tank it possibly is or is it a vent but that is quite ugly and quite obtrusive and horrible um, it takes up the whole <laughs> cupboard here so god knows how they actually got it in there it must have taken all this down can't close it over. I'm gonna have to can't see the hoses, so I can't see if the hoses are actually going into a nice high anti-siphon loop or not. All I can do is just feel the hoses. Originally the hoses would have gone upwards. It does actually go upwards. It's going up in that direction, but there's um, Got no chance of actually seeing anything if I could uh, Just going up this way um, They would go into a lot into a high anti-siphon loop so the inlet and outlet hoses would go right the way up which was um, stop siphoning effect when your boat's heaved over and stop your boat from sinking so it's it's quite important to turn these seacocks off when you're at sea um, but we need to remove this and find out where the hoses go see if they're actually only going up to that height which wouldn't be enough or do they go up to that height which um, up to deck level which would be enough I also need to go on the outside of the boat and find out what this is um, so it should be logically you'd have the pump out on the deck not on the side of the coach roof so that's quite obtrusive um, so I wouldn't have bothered having a holding tank at all if you're gonna sort of bodge the boat up like that so mm. it's a bit of a, an ugly solution right headlining always problem on a westerly it's called the, the westerly droop the headlining uh, droops down and uh, so this is no exception but you can actually see I can feel the balsa core here I can actually put my fingernail into it so that's the actual thickness of the deck where this um, vent cover would be there would be a that cowl over it which um, with an electric uh, computer fan inside it for um, ventilation um, and that uh, exposes the deck and shows the the balsa core which is uh, three quarters of an inch thick and um, and then the inner and outer casing so that does actually that balsa would normally absorb water and go very very soft right thank you I, um, Right, I'm going to 
in a moment climb over over that and have a look at the bow stem and have a look at the chain plate the bow stem um, fitting for the for the four stay um, you don't want to see my bum so I won't <laughs> do that just now I'm not going to look inside these uh, lockers to see the chain plates and um, oh that's quite interesting um, if um, if I go, can you go there, Jared? Yeah, let's see if we can squeeze. Right. Now, this is the official number, the registration number inside here. So, I don't know if, uh, can you see that, Jared? It's a, what's called the official number, oh, yeah. which is the registration number of the boat. And that is the tonnage. So, the net tonnage is 13. 0.65 tons. That's not the weight of the boat, that's not the displacement, that's uh, the cargo carrying capacity of the boat and that's its official number there which is the registration number. So that's often hidden because that's a sign that somebody's had to borrow money to buy the boat so often they hide it so that because it's a bit of a telltale sign that it's um, because you have to have an official number to um, to get a, a loan or a, a mortgage on a boat. So they hide them away. And that's called a carving plate. And the reason for that is that marine surveyors are a very, very old profession. And in the olden days, they would take a pen knife or a chisel and carve that number into a structural beam about, um, inside uh, the ship. And it would be they carved onto a transverse beam and it would be called the carving mark and in this case that's called the carving plate where officially you're supposed to carve that number in with the chisel but these ones sir, are made up on a computer and sort of um so in the machine. past someone's probably borrowed money against this boat yes yeah it oh, would it would, it would uh, almost certainly because this boat would have been the price of a house mm -hmm. when it was built um these Westleys were actually very expensive, so it's very likely that this boat would have had a mortgage on it in the past. And to, to register the mortgage or the loan, you have to have um, it has to be part one registered, which this is. And the carrying tonnage 13.65. I thought the boat only weighed about 12 tons. Um, is more than is that incorrect? No, the boat shouldn't weigh 12 tons oh. should be a bit less than that oh, right. but this is the this is 13.65 told that is the cargo carrying capacity so what it is is the length of the inside of the hull mm -hmm. multiplied applied by the beam from inside the hull mm -hmm. in meters and multiplied by the depth so the depth from the sole boards up up mm -hmm. to um, a where you're supposed to take a mean value but up, up into the, the inside mm -hmm. and then multiply that by uh, 0 0.32 and then that gives you the um, the net tonnage, the the, uh, the volume, the mm -hmm. internal volume in tonnes and that was used in the olden days for working out the cargo carrying capacity of the boat so, so how much you pay your harbour dues on mm. and a ton is a measurement of a barrel of wine, so it goes back to Roman times. So it's, <laughs> it's the tonnage was how many tons of uh, wine the boat could carry, so therefore how much harbour juice or tax it was going to be. Paid. Brilliant. Right, so we've got a water tank filler, which is here. So find the water tank somewhere, so that doesn't seem to be leaking. We've got a chain plate. Which is which is here on the deck? That's one of the new ones, I think. Uh huh. Yeah, it does look good. So the water tank is below the um, the in here. So I'll have to get all this up in a bit and have a look. Yeah. Um. Whoops. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, that's where I usually find people's dildo collection. <laughs> So, maybe right. cut that bit out. Cut that bit out. <laughs> I have actually. <laughs> really? Very God. often. I find that, usually find the whole sort of. Right, right we've got a um, cigarette lighter socket there for 
mice to charge up their phones. So if you've got a pet <laughs> mouse or a cat maybe who's maybe tech savvy or a very, very small person then or a child, they can actually sit there. God knows why you've got a cigarette lighter socket down there. Possibly for a vacuum cleaner if you've got a like an old fashioned car vacuum cleaner maybe. But I think I'd take those out because they're a bit ugly. This here is a um, a transducer which is uh, been cut off. I don't know if you can see this, um, but this, that transducer has actually been chopped off. It's a depth sounder transducer, it's had its wire chopped off, and it was mounted internally so it wasn't a through hole, it was just uh, mounted uh, on the inside. I'm looking at the mass step um, from down in the bilge, which actually seems to be okay. So the mass step is, is actually fine. Um, I'm looking at this mass compression post here and I'm going all the way up to the top. Um, you can see some water ingress here. The bolts have been removed for the mast um, step and it's possible that the piece of wood, just a piece of plywood up there underneath the, the mast step and the coach roof it's probable that that has been um, uh, saturated with water and pulled out. The mass compression post itself seems fine, so that's not uh, the end of the world. Right, do you want to come this way, Jared? Look at on the other side. Right, we've got uh, a up here. We've got plywood which would, would be on top of this so I'm going to recommend that this is replaced as you can see there's a big washer there and God knows what that washer's doing because I don't think it should be there um, it looks like there's another one so I think that what's happened is that to stop mass compression in the past somebody's actually driven in some washers to sort of shim it out um, there's washers here but you shouldn't have the bolt for the mast shouldn't be above the mast compression post, should it? It's uh, it's logical. In fact, actually, there is nut there, so that is um, completely crazy. So it looks as if the uh, the coach roof has actually dropped down onto this because that nut shouldn't come in contact with that wooden post. So. This requires a little bit of uh, thinking through because that just shouldn't be like that at all. Um, the the um, mass step bolt goes through and there's a nut there. And so how on earth are you going to get, do anything with that nut and get your mass step off with this compression post in the way? It's completely illogical. Um, looking at the bulkhead, it's not actually properly attached to the inside of the coach roof because this is this is moving so it's not really supporting the mass very well. So the tabbing where it's attached is uh, it's not actually attached properly. Right, um, I'm going to look in the bilge now below the, the mass compression post. Where's the best place for me? Uh, where you are. Okay. Jared, do me a favour. Yeah. Can you get your hand in there? Push up here? Yeah, you have to crouch down a bit more though to push up. Well done. Yeah, just lift that up, could you? Yeah. Pull that bit, of, bit out of the way. Right, what we've got to do is. Um, So if you could do uh, oh, all right, I see what you mean. Oh. Right. Well, there's a lot of water down there. Yeah, 
Mm-hmm. Right, the uh, new depth sounder transducer is here, so it's uh, taking place of that redundant one. Um, one thing I've noticed that there's quite a lot of water streaming down here, so the mass step is leaking and, and water coming down. And what you don't want is for this plinth to start decaying, so you don't want this piece of wood to start rotting. And as you can see, there's a lot of water here, so that needs to be cleaned away and kept dry. Keel bolts on a Westerly are are made out of stainless steel and they're good quality and quite thick so the keel bolts themselves don't usually cause a problem one thing that you do get is just movement between the hull and the keel but this one seems to be okay um, with these bigger westerlies which are the finger ones these transverse beams and, and stiffeners are actually very very strong so this has got a very good depth of this floor here um, so these are called floors and this is called the sole so it's not as in the floor of a house it's this is the sole board that you stand on and this is called a, a floor this is very very strong and well made and it's given the boat a lot of strength on small westerlies like GK29 these are, are much smaller and they break but this one is, is massive and strong so the mass compression post looks to me to be okay, but it's quite wet, so you want it to, to be uh, kept dry. And the key bolts are looking good. Okay, thanks Jerry. This is a bilge keel westerly. The keel bolts will be under here. And what I'm doing is checking for the bulkheads, um, making sure that they're not parting away from the inside of the hull. Quite often on bilge keel wesleys the tabbings or the bondings here which glue the hull to the bulkhead come away and they are coming away a little bit which is fairly common but I think that that's okay. for the position of the chain plates and unfortunately the chain plates are actually boxed in in plywood behind here because there's two pieces of plywood so you can't really see them Let's uh, go back to the chart table and see what's under here, possibly batteries. Right, yep, yeah, so we've got two batteries here. And they look fairly old. So I'll put a voltmeter on them to check them. And we've got a battery isolator switch which is down here. Now that's usually a, a red handled one that uh, isn't there, so we'll, we'll find it later on. I think there's another battery in the... Uh, in there? In there. Right, so the isolator switch is All here, right. so there's a switch here. Um, so it's in here, just uh, a cone and ball. This is the 230 volt system. So what I would do is push the, is the 230 volt system connected? Is it? Uh, I'm not sure. No, but I would push this to test it. It's not connected, so it's, uh, it's not tripping out. So you push the button here to test it, and it should uh, trip out. Engine now may be there, but probably not the 
it won't be the original because it's not the original engine, so it's not really worth writing that down. Right, um, with the batteries on, I'll check the electronics. The, the SSB radio won't work because the mast is down, but we do have um, a Simrad uh, plotter there, and I'll check the VHF. I can't check the VHF because the aerial's down, because the mast is down, it's unstepped. But I can at least see if it'll turn on or not, which it does. I'm going to turn it off channel 16. I usually check radios for channel 65, which is the National Coast Watch Institute, so it makes their day if you do a radio <laughs> check with them. Gives them something to do. And uh, won't be able to actually transmit because we haven't got the uh, uh, the mass stepped, but I'm just going to see if it will TX on, on the screen. Solent NCI, Solent NCI, this is Tally Ho, Tally Ho, over. Now they know who Tally Ho is. <laughs> right. Volt meter here, giving 12.2 volts, which is quite low. It should be around 13 volts. So it means that the, and that's with a solar panel working. So that, that's actually quite low. So the batteries are, are probably uh, had it. The SSB radio is here which uh, it fired up. We're not going to be able to receive anything because the, the mast is down, but um, it's actually, it's, uh, it is uh, coming on, and we'll see if it's going to transmit, which it does. But it's transmitting. Right, now, Seacox will be, it's got a, a nickel plated brass seacock which turns and I'll go on and look at the cooker it's uh, very very dirty so it's going to need a thorough service and the you can see from here that the gas hoses are definitely more than five years old so I'd recommend that that is fully serviced and the gas hose is replaced before you start to even test it. Right, um, get up this uh, saw board here. So we've got a, a third battery here um, which uh, could be for the engine cranking and then we've got um, more keel bolts at the the aft end there, and then we've got a, a kedge anchor, quite a small kedge anchor that won't really hold a boat of this size. Right, this is a, a Volvo Penta MD2040, so it's 38 horsepower, three cylinder engine, made by Perkins in England. Um, excellent engines. It's not the original to the boat, and this boat possibly would have had a, um, a Mercedes OM36 engine, which was a four-cylinder taxi engine. This one has been shoehorned in a little bit. The engine is probably 20 years old. Um, it's not a great fit because I can see some problems. One is access to fill up the um, header tank, the, the fresh water. Um, so the antifreeze is difficult because you've got this companionway in the way. So it's not really a very suitable engine for this um, space. Also the oil filler cap is a bit difficult so you'd have to use a, um, a funnel with a um, kind of a corrugated uh, pourer to be able to get the oil in there.
checking for emulsion or anything on it. Um, the next thing is that access to the oil dipstick is a little bit difficult because it's, uh, it's back here. I've already checked the oil on it, so I'm just going to. It took me ages to finally get the hole, find the hole again. Now, this engine coolant hose is in the way, and the diesel heater um, vent uh, hose is is also just a little bit in the way for getting at the injectors. So sometimes you need to bleed if if you've done some work on the engine. You might need to, or you ran out of fuel. You might need to bleed the injectors to be able to get the engine going again. So it's slightly in the way. The next thing that I've noticed is that the pulley belt here, the alternator belt, is very, very loose. So I'm having to, uh, I can easily turn that by hand. So this belt has actually been um, replaced. It's not too old, but whoever did it didn't tighten up the alternator because it's as loose as anything. Um, access to the impeller is, is acceptable but it's not good and it's partly because this uh, ducting hose uh, could do with being rerouted a little bit. They usually have a, a little sticker which has uh, got the engine number on and they also have a little brass plate which is riveted to the engine so I'm going to find those two things. I've noticed down here there is a water leak on the side of the heat exchanger so this heat, this plate needs to come off because what you don't want to happen is for water to drip on the alternator and it looks as if this alternator has been replaced at some stage because the pulley wheel here is quite new looking um, what you don't want to do is for the alternator to be um, ruined by water dripping onto it. I've also noticed that there's a uh, an automatic fire extinguisher in the engine compartment, which is a good idea. But if they do go off accidentally, they make a hell of a mess. <laughs> Thanks. Here is the engine number plate um, label, which is quite good. Um, apart from the fact that the half of the label is falling off, so I can't quite see it. But I can see it's a, a an MD twenty forty D, so that ages the engine. And Volvo are very good at, um, at having a an, a find my engine page on volvopenta.com, so you can find out from the serial number exactly how old your engine is. Access here to the oil filler cap is actually fine. So from this uh, rear access panel, access is much better. However, access to the uh, header tank for the um, coolant isn't particularly good. Um, it's got a, uh, a nice um, hearth gearbox, so that's, that's perfectly uh, good, except we'd need a, a spanner to check the oil inside it. It's water cooled. Um, I have found sometimes that these water cooler pipes do actually corrode, and um, so that will need a, a little bit of attention as well. It does all look quite dirty and corroded. The engine mounts do delaminate on Volvo engines, so I'm looking to see, see if they're actually bulged. I can't see any bulges on them, but access isn't particularly good. Um, and the the engine number plate, that uh, that stamp, that plate that's riveted on that I told you about is actually here, but access to actually see it is, is very limited. Right, I'll just take some pictures. Um, That's uh, 
a modern stern gland which is actually mounted onto a, a plywood bulkhead which is very good so the stern tube is is behind it made out of um, uh, bronze um, very nice stern gland and then looking aft we've got the water heater and water pump so that's the uh, immersion heater or chlorifier so that's cooled by the or water is coming from the engine um, and it's also electrical it's got a 230 volt element on it too oh, the electric is out. <laughs> mm. Mm. a redundant homemade radiator for the, an old um, hydronic uh, Ebers batcher system where so this is a, a heating radiator in the cabin um, looks like it's made up by somebody themselves just out of copper pipe and it's got a, a thermostatic control there but this is redundant so this could be removed now um, down here we've got the uh, seawater intake coolant seacock for the engine and the strainer, which is quite easy to get to. Um, we've got the accumulator for the water system. We've got a battery charger. The battery charger is a long way from the batteries. Really, that should be in the under the chart table rather than way back here, because you want that as close to the fuse panel as possible. There's no point in having all these long wires going all over the boat. Um, Access to the inside of the transom is very limited, so I'm going to have to uh, climb in there. You don't want to see my bum. <laughs> so, um, but that is access into it. And this is the new heater that's been installed. And this is the um, fuel pump, sorry, fuel filter here. And fresh water pump there. remember on the inside of the, of the head compartment we're wondering why that pipe is coming out the side that's just simply a vent so it's a very very large vent for the holding tank which is coming out of here now that really should be on the side of the hull because it smells um, and then this is the waste pump out so it does go directly into the tank um, so I might be able to